Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Houseless Podcast. I'm Peter Agassin. I'm the host, producer of the show. This is my weekly podcast. Thank you for tuning in. If you're a subscriber, much thanks and appreciation goes out to you guys. If this is your first time listening, I do this every week. You can subscribe on iTunes. Please rate it and write a review on iTunes. Let's get those numbers up a little bit. If you listen to it on SoundCloud, it's the Houseless Podcast on SoundCloud. So anybody that has a SoundCloud account, if you're feeling this or any of the previous episodes that I've done and you're on there, just hit that repost button. Um, It's a great way to get the word out and spread the word a little DIY style. And uh, I genuinely appreciate it. Every episode is edited and engineered by CJ Stewart. Last week's episode with DeAnthony Parks, if you haven't listened, was guest edited by my man Controller7 out in the Bay. So thanks to him for stepping in, you know. As you as you know, when you do something every week, sometimes life gets in the way, and CJ needed a sub for last week, so Tommy, aka Controller Seven, stepped in and helped me out tremendously. Thanks to him. Uh, today's episode is a really great one, by the way. I'm foregoing any music just because it's a long conversation, and I got a lot of st- st- stuff to say in the intro as well. But my guest today is Photo Rob, also known as Robert Mayer. A great photographer here in New York City and he and I had like a couple of years where we collaborated almost on a weekly bi-weekly basis when I was the talent buyer at the Knitting Factory the music venue in New York City that was once located at 74 Leonard Street in Tribeca uh, right below Canal Street I booked the shows there for probably the last three years that the club was open at that location. Now many people know of the Brooklyn location as well as the other satellite clubs. But while I worked there, I did a tremendous amount of hip hop shows. I did a lot of other genres too. And if you've ever been to the club, then you know that uh, during that period of time. And uh, shout out to all my uh, fellow staff members. For the most part, there's some really great ones. A couple of them I didn't get along with. But hey, you know, this is how it goes. But uh, yes, to all the, the folks I used to work with there, I have a lot of great friends I made from that club. And Rob is one of them. Photo Rob is a guy I met at the Knitting Factory. In fact, I walked in while he was backstage setting up this kind of light rig to take photos. Um, if I'm not mistaken, personally, I think it was for a Duck Down Records showcase. So people know Duck Down from Boot Camp Click, Black Moon, Sean P., May he rest in peace. And, uh, you know, Helta Skelta, OGC, Smith & Wesson. So I think that they had brought him in because he had shot something previously for them. And I walk backstage and there's this guy with his gear kind of getting set up. And, you know, if you're a promoter or a talent buyer it, or a booking agent and stuff like that, usually the photo stuff is cleared ahead of time, you know. And this was something where I was like, yo, what's up, man? Like, who are you? And uh, we started kind of chatting. And I'm a pretty open guy to anybody. So uh, I pretty quickly realized that Rob was genuinely uh, coming from a good place. He wasn't trying to do too much. He wasn't trying to muscle his way into a club or or whatever. So he went on to shoot uh, backstage at this particular show. And um, essentially capturing the people that were both performing and that happen to also be backstage. And if you've ever been to a hip hop show in New York City, and often um, in probably many other cities and towns all over the world, backstage at a hip hop show. In New York City though, there's a lot of people there. And sometimes people just go and hang out in the backstage, they don't even watch the show. Um, So what I would come to see as Rob started returning to the club, I started asking him to shoot shows for me. And uh, what we ended up capturing over this two and a half year period is an incredible snapshot, a time capsule of this period of time in New York City at these, primarily these hip hop shows. And um, it was about maybe 2007 and eight up until 2009. And uh, Rob shot a lot of shows. I can't even put a number on it. But it was probably a good 25 or, or more. 
he has this website. So in my conversation with him, you can go to this website and you might be able to get a better reference of what we're talking about. Because we basically spend our conversation uh, reconnecting, waxing, nostalgic about those shows at the Knitting Factory. So if you want to follow along, go to mugs.smugmug.com backslash uh, I'm going to try to say I Hopefully I say this right for y'all. This is 1-hip-hop backslash the-knitting-factory backslash. That's hilarious. I'm sure that's an easier way to find that, you know. But so that's kind of like a photo site that Rob had been posting these. And these were all posted the day or two days after these shows played out. So over the course of our conversation, we basically talk about a lot of these shows and stuff. A lot of the conversation, we're also just giving people shout outs. So in a way, it's just like you're sort of uh, hanging out with us as we catch up. Because I, I don't see Rob very frequently at all. And um, since the club closed and uh, since my time there, which now is over a decade practically, or about a decade now, um, we reconnect and have continuously talked about trying to do a book and do a gallery show and do or, or do a documentary about this time that I was the booker at the Knitting Factory in New York City and doing these hip-hop shows. So just a little like rundown of some of these things because it, it captured New York at a very particular time. So this is like pre-Action Bronson, pre-Pro uh, Era, pre-Aesop Mob. This is all like the year or two years before any of those guys really broke at all you know um so it was an interesting kind of mix of like the golden era 90s uh new york acts for the most part and a real vestige of like the true kind of underground you know uh working mcs that were really grinding it out and it was also like the myspace era too you know but nevertheless, there's some amazing shows. I reformed Sets of Sonic for a reunion show. We did the uh, album release party for Q-Tips, the Renaissance. Um, I People like I had Daz FX and J.Ru the Damager, uh, the Beat Nuts, Power Roll, Brand Nubian played multiple times. Uh, guys like Homeboy Sandman, Fresh Daily were regulars there during that period of time. I also did the Low End Theory, New York City with Daddy Kev. And we did a string of uh, New York City residencies of the very well-known and beloved LA party. So the whole collective of guys, including Flying Lotus and Edit and Daedalus, these all, all these guys came and performed. Uh, who else? We did Royce of Five Nine, uh, lots of boot camp stuff, uh, Master Ace, uh, The Alcoholics, um, Nice and Smooth did my birthday party. All this is captured at this website. Digging in the Crates, even Gary Wilson and Peanut Butter Wolf and Edon. Um, up to my very last show, which was Rockham, a uh, big blowout with Rockham, Black Thought, The Legion, Brand Nubian, and a bunch of DJs and Nola Darling and a bunch of acts. It was amazing. So we just kind of riff and talk about this stuff. So if you were there, you'll probably get a kick out of it. If you weren't, then, you know, it'll probably be somewhat uh, fun. So, But you can s still reference what we're talking about if you look at that website, you know. Um, and I'll post some of the highlight photos on my Instagram, too, which is at Culturama. If you like the podcast, too, you can follow us at Twitter, um, Houseless Pod. And before we jump into this... And I know I'm going long, but I've been thinking about this. I don't know, you know, I got to figure out a way to generate a little bit of revenue with this podcast to keep things going, to keep delivering shows on a weekly basis for you guys. There is a definitely production overhead, you know, to edit it on, on audition, uh, the, the, the discs that I record these on or those little whatever things, the micro SD things batteries my time you know these things uh, sometimes take about five hours just the conversation um and tracking people down and traveling so should i do a patreon would that make sense um would finding the appropriate advertisers to get down but i don't want to be an ad man i'm too busy creating all of the content 
you know, so I'm in a kind of interesting place as we come to the end of this year and I'm um, trying to continuously uh, create interesting and very unique kinds of conversations with my guests and I know that some of y'all really like it and I want to keep creating more and more I would love to be able to do this consistently I would love to do it two times a week that would that's my ideal thing even from the very beginning but it is not easy and it's not easy when you're doing it all completely out of pocket so if you have any ideas or thoughts or if you want to advertise on the podcast or any other kind of innovative ways to to create revenue or to get it like crowdsourced that's an alternative to Patreon, let me know. Hit me up either on Twitter at HousesPod. You can write me on the SoundCloud page or you can write an email to uh, Peter at AugustinAgency.com. There's many ways to find me and reach, reach out. Let me know. I want to keep uh, producing these for you, but I got to come up with some creative ways to get a little bit of funding to kind of put some gas in the tank. You know what I mean? So with that being said, uh, why don't we get into this conversation with the one and only Photo Rob, a New York legend. Try to follow along on that website I gave you. And when I post it, I'm going to post this link too. And you'll see, we talk about a lot of shows and we just kind of riff on it. So hopefully some of y'all out there will, will dig it. And go back and listen to some of these older episodes too. You know, dig in a little bit. I've been doing this for a year and a half now. Got some really great stuff. So, all right, y'all, check it out, and I will catch you on the outro. All right, peace, y'all. I know uh, how we met, where we met, but where do you come from? Um, you're a New Yorker, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean. I'm a, I'm like a metro area kid. Like okay. I, I was originally from from Queens. I lived in I lived in Queens till I was about five. I actually went back there when I was doing a Dres video. To the neighborhood. Yeah, I was like, you know, I needed some B roll. I'm like, let me go back to, you know, I think it was 189th Street, and I was, and I went back over there. You know, my memories were. I'm not going to go into that because that's a waste of everyone's time. But um, I went back to the area. Uh, but we moved out of there when I was five because Son of Sam was was actually active, the serial wow. killer. Yeah, and he was killing women that looked like my mom. So my mom's like, "Let's get out of here," and we actually moved to New Jersey in wow. Creskill, New Jersey, which we lived. I lived in. I, I grew up a good part in Creskill, New Jersey, and then um, after college, I moved back into the city. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering that you have a distinct vernacular. You know, you got an accent, you know? I do. You do. But it's a little mix of New York and New Jersey. Well, also, too, for the past, um, you know, I mean, I've been involved in in, in hip-hop culture, too, hanging out right. and, and stuff like that. Um, I don't really know. Um, but I'm kind of, I'm a bit of a chameleon in that, um you know, I kind of, it's it's funny, like if I go on a photo shoot that is, uh, you know, business executives, I, I'm wearing a jacket right? Yeah, and sure, shoes of course. and a tie on occasion. So, you know, I kind of just try to compliment where I'm working at the time, you know, but I'm a hip hop dude and I, and I love it. Um, but, you know, my mom, it's funny because we're, we're out here in Brooklyn recording and my mom grew up close to here on Woodruff Avenue. Um, and my and her father was a uh, was a surgeon in Caledonian Hospital, which is now um, an apartment building. Wow! So and, and what's so crazy? Woodruff, what is that? That's um. So what neighborhood would that be? Is it? That's just the bottom of Park Slope. Right. Yeah. It's like right on the bottom of Park Slope. Yeah. By the big cemetery, almost the path close to it. She's like she was like central, if you right, know okay. where Woodruff is. Right. But I don't know the area that great. But I I can tell you that um, you know it's just it's just amazing to like I, I was I was thinking of maybe passing by the old house. Yeah. Um, while I'm out here. Yeah. Or maybe going to Bonnie's Grill for some some of the best uh, hot wings that are in in the city. Is that right? I, I believe so. I haven't had them there. 
I think they're the best in town. Amazing. I'm going to have to join you. You know what I'm saying? One of these days. Um, yeah. And see, because that, that's the thing, too, is I think, especially given the context of meeting at the Knitting Factory, and, uh, you know, everyone comes from different places, you know, uh, and that for, for a window of time, for a couple of years, for the shows that you and I specifically were uh, working on together in a way, like, you know, I was booking the shows there. People, obviously with the podcast, I think I've talked about it, you know, a handful of times, but I was the talent buyer at the Knitting Factory uh, for its last basically three years of operation when it was on Leonard Street in Tribeca, basically, below Canal Street. And um, so I met you this very randomly, and I want to get to that in, in a sec, but but I'm trying to build up the context around it where it's like, uh, you know, you were just, I just walked into the room and you were setting up your gear, and I'm like, who is this, who's this guy? You know, ah. like it's another, you know, in the club, you never know who take, people take liberties for any I took number a, of reasons. I took a great liberty. I literally right. brought my shit and set it up in the club. Like right. I set up my backdrop, <laughs> and it's funny. Like in the in the you know, it's funny. Like I was trying to, you know, I wanted to shoot for Double XL and, and the Source and all these these great publications, and I'd bring my book over there, and and they were you know like they had their photographers and friends who right. who, who they trusted you know to do a good job with these shoots, um, you know so. It's funny though. It, it was it was really organic. It wasn't like I, it was this great planned. Like I'm gonna do this this backstage project. It happened naturally. I was I actually had a I was going through a tough time back in 2005, and you know hip hop music sort of resonates with my spirit. Period. Right, right. And it, 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 I feel empowered by it, and I love it. It's just like in my in my um, it's just like it's so connected to my spirit and my soul, so that. Like, I was just, it was kind of mental health to go. Um, but I had done a I, I wanted to get access to artists, so I would go to the clubs, and I was like, well, you know, when you have on-camera flash, it's just, it's just, the quality is limited. So, Definitely. like, I brought, I started to bring lights to the clubs. Oh, interesting, yeah. Because, well, you know, from my, where I stand as far as, like, working in a club or now as an agent and whatever, when people want to take photos of artists, it's usually standard to be like, no, there's no flash photography. You know, you don't want a photographer shooting fucking flashes in an artist's face when they're on stage performing. And stuff. Yeah, a lot of times they'll let you shoot for the first three songs because oh, they know people will have flashes. Right, and then they kind of clear the pits out. Right. I guess it also is contingent on like the size of the venue, and but nevertheless, I had never really encountered. Uh, a photographer like you a previous it's usually rogue guys that will come for one show and uh, shoot and then disappear and you never hear or see from them again or, or the photos end up on like Brooklyn Vegan or like on a, at least a New York or some publication or Brooklyn blog Brooklyn Vegan <laughs> yeah it's still kicking uh, we you had a lot of photos that were published there I think yeah and you know what like, yeah, well you know shout out to Brooklyn Vegan because you know, there were certain outlets that were covering, you know, independent hip hop, and and certain were not. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, and and it it was based on like the, the people who were covering. You know, like the individuals like um, that were covering. Right. Well, no different than what we were doing uh, during that period of time. It's totally based on the individual. I think by yeah. I, I had a certain mm -hmm. ambition and uh, kind of dumb persistence Absolutely. in like booking these shows and hip hop shows oftentimes are not easy to book. They're often, you know, there's a lot of discouraging people like people that will try to keep you from doing that as far as like upper management, security. People often are have a connotation about rap shows that has been, you know, it's just like a lot of dumb myths about it, too. And um so having forged through that with the time of the knitting factory create enabled these like shows to come together because I often curated a lot of these bills. They weren't just like built like and ready. And the fact that you we started and then 
one show turned into more and more and more during a period of time where you were you took the initiative and I think you were living way uptown or you you came down from somewhere with all your gear like it was and it was like you know you had the big bag or two bags or something you yeah, know I was thinking that on the train and uh, you know as I was riding out here and it's like I would get my gear put it on a hand truck and come down there and then you know shoot I, and I did this a lot and and then I would leave at like two in the morning, right? You know, with the hand truck, with all my gear, and take the train back home. And you know, when you're the the ride to the knitting factory is a lot different from the ride when you're leaving at two oh, a.m. Yeah. Like literally, there's just people who are hammered. There's, I mean, one time one guy sat next to me and he kind of kicked my legs with his legs, like some kind of guy trying to be tough with me. Uh -huh. And I'm like, I, I was like, wow, sh you know, I, like, should I say something to this guy? Or am I going to end up sma having to smash my camera bag on his head or something? Because right. he was kind of acting tough. And then I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you know what? You got like quite a bit of expensive gear. Here. Right. You know, <laughs> like, I think I'm just going to get up and I'm going to go sit over there. Let this, you know, right. I'm going to let it go on this one. You know, and, and stepping out of way, way your pride isn't that easy. I saw a guy like vomiting in his hands, and I'm, you know, it's like people are hammered at oh, two a.m. Yeah. in the city. Oh yeah, and I, I lived way out in Bushwick at that time, and it was to take the train. It was an hour on the train, and it was this was when well, it was definitely before Uber and Lyft and all these things even existed. So you only had yellow cabs, and it was like getting a yellow cab to get, go from Tribeca to basically the very edge of of Bushwick almost to East New York at like two o'clock in the morning or yeah. later was, you know, that was a fucking pain in the ass yeah, and falling asleep cheap. on the train too. I fell asleep on the train a couple of times and it's yeah. not cheap. Yeah. Like one time I forgot my cards. I don't know how I did it, but I forgot my, my cards and I had to jump on a cab and zip home and zip back. And I think the round, it was like, I think it was like uh 30 bucks each way, but it was like, damn. You know, well, yeah, because you weren't making any money doing these. <laughs> you were doing well, it. Oh, yeah. That's the thing. Is like I was doing these to gain access to, to the artist. You know? Right. Which is interesting. That's kind of like how, how and why this podcast exists, too. I don't make a dime doing this at all. But I, but the, you know, the value comes from having these conversations and being able to go back to them and, and sharing them with people. It's not that different than how you had all these photos. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, it's, um, I just want to say, like, you know, I kind of understand that these photos are, are, are all of our photos in the sense that, like, you know, I, I you know, by your kindness, I, I, I gained access to these shows, Peter. And, and by the kindness of the artists to let me photograph them and the community, like, that we're a part of, um... You know, this is these are documents of all of our lives. Like I don't I don't stake claim to like I don't take credit for any of these genius artists and I certainly don't take credit for what was going on at the time. I happen to be there and, and be documenting it in the, in the best of my abilities and 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 I think it it it's a nice capsule of time and I believe it's important. So um, I do too. But but like we, we it's this is like our lives you know this is our, our lives in 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 a small sort of like um you know horse blinders way like uh it's a small piece of it you know without sound without without memory you know but um these are these are like you know visual capsules of 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 all of our lives like well absolutely and and, and me going through these two and basically to give some people some some reference, you know, there's a website in which uh, Photo Rob's uh, photos from these shows that we did together, and I'm going to get more specific very soon, exists. So we're kind of going to be referencing that during this conversation. But even before jumping into that, looking back at these, there's already a small... Uh, constituency of friends of mine and artists, people that people loved and admired that have passed on since 
oh, uh, yeah. since these shows there's and, and and you know we can even talk about it just briefly now I mean obviously Sean P uh, you have some great Rest photos of peace. At rock peace, Ra Sean. rock Raider who you have multiple shows we did with rock me and rock Raider did several shows together and he was such a kind and funny and very accessible and open-minded guy as far as a promoter he was a great promoter an incredible DJ but those shows with the executioners and even the gong DJ battle and eventually would do I would do the DMC battles a lot of that all really started from me and Rock Raider just uh, riffing on doing shows together so rest in peace to Rock Raider yeah uh, peace to the executioners no Rock question Swift and rest in peace Rock Grandmaster Rock Raider yeah um, even another another artist who was Featured only once here, who I actually released some records from when I was doing my record label, which was before the Knitting Factory, was um, we did a CMJ show with Stetsasonic, People Under the Stairs, um, and uh, there was a, a kind of a group of guys that performed called The Great Minds, and, uh, which was Mike G of the Jungle Brothers, my friend Doomy Wright. Uh, YZ and then a rapper named by the name of Cadence who was in a group called Raw Produce. He passed away a few years ago. Rest and in peace. Yeah, he was a great friend of mine and a great producer, rapper too. And he was captured. And then also I just noticed too uh, Pumpkinhead as well who's featured here yeah. in South Southpaw. These stand here as these kind of, you know, postcards from the past and uh the Knitting Factory as a venue is a very particular place at a very very particular kind of time in New York, a, a, a period of transition in New York nightlife, uh, sort of before Williamsburg and Bushwick especially, uh, hadn't really broken wide open as far as venues. So everything was still, it was that last moment where Manhattan kind of was still popping off in a way, uh, at least the, the vestiges of the Manhattan of of the past, you know, with a lot of clubs have, have closed in Manhattan and new ones have popped up in Williamsburg, Bushwick, Ridgewood, Queens, so on and so forth. Yeah, um, I mean, there were some cool ones out in Brooklyn, and, like Sputnik. Oh, yeah, Sputnik. Was there was great. Southpaw. You Southpaw, know? of course, right down the street from here. Oh, yeah, it was you, right down the street. Yeah, down Fifth Ave, and you shot a bunch of stuff there. Um, let's get into some of these photos. I'm trying to remember um, the first show I think I ever met you at. Do you recall this at all? Yes, I do. And um, I don't. shout out to Torre, by the way, and Susio Smash, um, yes, yes. because it was. It was I think I met Tor. Tor was Tor brought me. He's like, "Yo, you want to shoot my daily conversation show at the Knitting Factory?" Mm. I think that was the first Knitting Factory show that I did. So shout out to Torre. Um, for inviting me to do that. We've since become um, brothers, and I've had the the, um, the great blessing to work on some album covers with Tor. Um, I think, I don't know if he used one of the pics for the daily conversation that I had taken. Uh -huh. I think he just used it and didn't really ask. And I was, I was like, oh, man, that's so cool. Like, I wasn't... You know, there's times where people use my stuff and they're not asked, and it's and it's and it's frustrating. Right. But like when it's dope MCs, like I remember hearing um, Sky Zoo and Touré. Like I went to a, um, Pete Rock's birthday, and uh, DJ Premier was there. And he's like, "Yo, he gives me a CD on the street, a mix. Uh -huh. He hands DJ Premier hands me his." Um, um, look outside looking in mix right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I was like oh my god it was just like for me it was like a religious experience when you meet TJ Premier oh, yeah, you know, I was like oh my god yeah. he gave me a mix so it was a CD so I played that I downloaded it in my iPod back in the day and I played that and I would run around the reservoir and there was a joint called uh, Click there were two joints by with Sky Zoo and Touré. One was called Click, and I was like, "This is." I loved it. It was like that. That CD was the soundtrack to to that summer. I think it was '06 or something like that. Yeah, I think Touré and Sky Zoo played. I mean, they were. It was, it's also a great document of like that. Maybe 2007. I don't yeah, know. it I had can to easily go back. It was 2007 for sure. Um, and I feel like those guys. 
were sort of at the forefront of this very particular scene in New York at that at that time. Um, that was like a, a new kind of wave of independent, if you will, artists, you know, sort of in the MySpace era, you know, before yeah. a lot of the, before the kind of quick trajectory to blow up from like the quote unquote underground to be like a spot, like a pop sensation, like yeah. the way like Aesop Rocky basically did it and stuff. These are guys yeah. that sort of were kind of held the same like kind of, you had to work pretty hard to get established. You know, there was a lot less um, easy passes to just like slide up that like that staircase of success, if you will. So Torre and Sky Zoo, obviously, like Homeboy Sandman is another one that was a regular at the club. Um, Fresh yeah. Daily, uh, and shout out to Fresh Daily, yeah, good friend of mine. Who's yeah, there's a lot of them. Now there's a West. Yes, yeah. So yeah, so the Duck Down show was the first time I saw you. I, you, I walk in the club, I'm like, who's this guy? He's got a fucking burlap, uh, you know, ah! <laughs> um, back hilarious. and uh, and a gigantic like spotlight on a on a stand. Yeah, I think you were like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, who who confirmed this? Like, yeah, are you supposed to even be here? Yeah. And that's what I would do. Like, I'm a nice guy, right? Right. So people would, I you know, it's funny. I did that at. Uh, South Pole was the first one, and I set my backdrop in the back because you know Pharaoh Monch was going to be there, and I and and at the Duck Down show I was really excited, so I sure. would set them up, and then someone <laughs> would come to me and be like, you know, I, the guy at South Pole was like, "What the fuck are you doing?" <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, I mean, like, oh, I'm really sorry. This isn't cool. I was just going to, you know, take a couple of photos, and you know, and like <laughs> I think I, at South Pole I had plugged in." like a hot light into the fucking, oh my God. you know, I mean, that's a lot of electricity. Like you could short out the whole system back there. But eventually I would start bringing flash units, you know, low wattage flash units right. that, that you just plug in and, you know. Um, what were you shooting with? What kind of camera was that then? You that know? was, that was, yeah, I originally started with the early Canon. It's like, so another thing that made this ver possible to do is like, so early con concert photography, when you'd go, you'd get like 800 or 1600 speed film and you have to have a flash and it was very difficult to get good photography right. if the if the lighting was low. And right. most of the times it was low spots. And, and it was very tough to get good concert photography. If you look at concert photography pre, like, 2006, you'll see that it's, you know, film-based. And anything at night, indoor venues, um, it's just difficult to shoot. So you had to really know what you're doing and it had Definitely. to know your exposures. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it was black and white because it could be pushed. Push right. means to be shooting a film at a higher ASA than it was and developing it as such. So pushing it so you could try to get more range out of it. Right. So shooting, what, 800 or something like that? You shoot 800 at 16 and you, and you develop it a little longer right. so that it puts a little bit more silver onto silver halide mm -hmm. onto, the, onto, the, onto the film. So long story short, now you started in 2006, you started to have the prices of these digital cameras come down where you could afford them. And the, the print size, the megapixels started to reach, you know, 10 megapixels. So you could print a magazine page. Right. And that was really it because, you know, if you were working as an editorial photographer, you had to have the quality to print a magazine page. When and you say a magazine page, you mean like... Uh, eight and a half, eleven. Yeah, right. Eight and a half, eleven magazine page size. And then if it was a, what's called double truck, the, the full open spread, you know, you could, you could expand the file size and it, and it was good enough. I think at that time I started with a 20D and then I'd... I'd about when I did this project, then I purchased the, the 5D, which came out, which was, I was really excited because it was a full frame, you know, digital camera. And the original chips were not full frame. Right, interesting. Okay. You know, and they were the chips would be, you know, set into, you know, the SLRs, and they were about two-thirds the size or whatever it is. Right. Um, so that's what you shot all of these on, right, basically? Yeah, and, and what was great is, like, so this... The technology changed the whole game right. because when you're shooting digitally, you can shoot a lot, right? I can run off six, eight hundred frames. Right. When you're shooting film, you you got rolls of thirty six. You shoot five rolls, 
at at twenty seven dollars for developing and contact sheets before you even make prints. Right. You know, four rolls you're looking at. You know, do the math. You know, like a couple hundred dollars. Yeah. You're getting yeah. you know one hundred twenty dollars. So, blah blah blah. Long story short, like it's not. It wasn't that easy to do. Right. In a way, too, this even though the technology has updated this, the, your style of photography at, um, that we're talking about too is in a, part of a great tradition in New York City, where there, uh, but that was mostly in the Bronx. I feel like, and I, obviously, there's probably exceptions, and I didn't grow up in New York in the '70s and the early '80s, which is what I'm kind of referring to through the early '90s. So mm-hmm. those. Um, skating rinks those uh yep. old school jams where they would yep. have the backdrop the airbrush backdrop oh there's got to be a lot more photography and personal collections that's that's going to start surfacing or uh, man i hope so because you know um i met joe conzo you know through doing what i do and right. man, we're good buddies now and he's a great legend man. and and you know, like there's there's certain guys from that era. Um, I don't want to start mentioning names because I'll forget someone, and they'll be mad at me when I see them at the next gallery show or whatever. Like, hey, you didn't mention me in the podcast, <laughs> which they're not even going to listen to. But <laughs> however, however, long story short, like you know, just because it's something that we're not seeing doesn't like this. There's, there's got to be tons of of stuff that we're not aware of, like. You know, occasionally on Instagram, so I'll be like, "Yo, look what I found in the shoebox!" And it's like this crazy photograph of like yeah. young legends just hanging out. Like recently, someone found a picture of Tupac and Nas hanging out at a show. Right. And um, shout out to Vicky Toback. Um, um, well, there's instances like that here for sure, where you see um, artists that normally wouldn't be together taking flicks together. And I think a lot of that is when I, I would try to like you know mix up the bill a little bit and and invite cats out. There were rappers uh, who became regular, like basically regulars, like at a bar, like that would be at every show. That of course I would, you know, the guest lists were pretty epic um, at those Ninny Factory shows. So it'd be like two hundred people on the guest list, you know. How many would show though? Twenty? No, like about half. Uh, there was always a lot, you know, depending on the show. I would I would constantly be in hot water with the with the GM and the, and the and the box office people at the club yeah, because I was I would stack that list super high because it's like these some of these guys I just wouldn't even feel like asking them to pay but so but yeah, and it like, just how do you like, ask Chuck D to pay right know, like, well, yeah yeah or even yeah I mean I I mean and I just wanted them to hang out and like otherwise they wouldn't be there to hang out but there was a couple I want there's a couple. Um, rapper and producer guys that I love very much. I love their music. That would be regulars there. So Psycho Less from the B Nuts. He was at yeah, many man, many that's shows. That's the thing. That's the thing. Um, and you shot some stuff. You even did like a, a regular photo shoot for him at the in the front party. You remember that? Like Yo, the daytime. I gotta tell you something. There was okay. There was a moment. I think it might have been a Das Effect show. Right. I mean, shout out to the DJs by the way. Like people don't know. So, like when you start talking about like. The Q-Tip show, like DJ Scratch, oh my god, like, was the opening DJ for that. Um, Jazzy J, I think, did he open for for? Uh, Jazzy J was on when I did Nice and Smooth. He was on that, that. was the Nice and Smooth, or it wasn't or the uh, Dos Effects. Maybe, yo, Jazzy so, J was there a couple times. There's some mean, great photos of him if too. You the young legend. kids don't know who right. these names are that I'm talking about. Please. Definitely Google and do your research. Like Jazzy J. Like there was a moment where I was backstage and I'm hanging out with Psycho Less, who's like phenomenally cool dude. Yeah. And and Jazzy J. And they're kind of telling stories and I'm talking and I'm hanging out with like we're talking like pioneers and just brilliant uh, musicians and like I mean the history. Um, Jazzy J is responsible for um, producing. The, the first the, you know some of the earliest Def Jam releases um, and, and and a lot of jam stuff before that I'm not the historian right in terms of like you know writing you know like you want to find out the real history of the stuff you know talk talk to someone who's around during those park jams and stuff like that but you know but there was a faction these of are that gods, man. yeah and like, they were hanging out there at that club at that moment so, so I mean as a hip hop fan you know just 
sitting there like with, with Uncle Ralph McDaniels and guys like and and you know, I, you know, I watched the you know watched the shows and 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 talking to these legends like it was it, it was almost like an out of body experience like, am I really here like, you know when we d- when you did the Rock Ham show. Okay. Why don't we end, talk like, about that? I woke up the next day and I, I was like in my bed. I was like, uh, you know, I, I was like, did I really go on stage with Raquel? Like, I wanted to pinch myself. So, for people that might not know now, obviously, uh, you know, yeah, I guess you were. It was at a period of time that you sort of had to be at this show, but it was a particular show um, that I booked. It's my last show on my last night working. Do you want to go into factory. that right now, or do you want to save that for the end? Um, that's so exciting. That was a big one. Yeah, uh, we can come. We can circle back around to it. You're man. in charge, buddy. I mean, it's. A, it. I feel like. Um, why don't we talk about it? Because uh, it sort of represents um, a little bit of everything. Because I tried to. It really does. I tried to it's accommodate everybody. A okay, and starting out. Yeah. So basically, uh, we'll start by talking about um, my last show at the club. So it was late December of 2008, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, The the Ninny Factory closed basically uh, New Year's of of 2008. Was that the last show? It was was my last show. It was your last show, so it was the last big hip-hop show. Yeah, and I had actually booked... uh, You know, the Ninny Factory was three stories, three floors underground. So there's three venues. There was the old office, which is all the way at the bottom, the tap room, which is in the middle, and the main space. So it was 500 capacity, 200 capacity, and 100 capacity. And my last night at the club, I booked all three floors and had to be... They were all completely different shows. So it was like more like a... It's like electronic music and, and DJs and stuff in the old office, machine drum, actually, and a bunch of really kind of cutting edge, like, producer-type dudes. And then there was, like, it's just a straight kind of, like, Brooklyn rock show in the tap bar. And then in the main space, it was the rock hem hip-hop, you know, extravaganza. All at the same time happening. All different kinds of people that I worked with over the short period of time that I was at the club. And uh, it was tough for me to go down to the other two floors as the rock hem show was... Did you Did you get punched in the face that night? I did get punched in the face that night. At the very end of the night, it was a great way to cap off my my time, uh, my tenure you know working there at the club. That's what I want you to talk about the music. But that's funny. Like, it's it's got to be so hard to balance one show, that final show, and all those levels. <laughs> but like, it, it's kept it's punctuated in the end by you know what, right in the kisser by a fellow uh, um, staff member. Nonetheless, I mean, he probably had a resentment. He was holding it for some long time, and <clears throat> oh, for sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I was like, about oh, it. I can't wait to do that. The last night, I'm gonna. Do I've been it. waiting to do. Can't this fire me time. now, buddy. Yeah. Well, people looked at me like, you know, who is this guy? You know, he's got, uh, he's doing these shows. You know, uh, he's got long hair down to like, you know, his waist. Oh my god, that's right. Big yeah. beard. Yeah, I looked more like a metal dude than anything. You know, at the time. Um, but so it was a very hectic night, nonetheless. It was super sold out, all of all floors. You know, it's and interesting too. At that time, people don't know. Uh, there was a rumor that um, the Roots would possibly become the Late Show band. Yeah, it wasn't confirmed. It wasn't confirmed. But at that time, you started to see the Roots hanging around in New York a little bit. Yes. So I think that's when I said, you know what, they got the gig. Right. Because they've been in New York for like the past three weeks. Right. And they had done some shows, and I'm like, they're in New York. These guys are in New York. And that night, um, you know, it's a real cool thing to see uh, musicians, you know, like Rakim, The Roots. Um, you know, I mean, Questlove was spinning that night. Yeah, so I, yeah, yeah. So basically, it was Black Thought with Questlove DJing for him, which really rarely, if ever, happens. It's probably happened a handful of times in their career. And I booked that through, initially through my friend Rahani, who's just, he was also a backstage alumni at uh, the Nimmy Factory. He's just my homeboy from Philly. And, um, so me, him, and Black Thought every once in a while hang out, like, and get drinks and stuff. 
and uh, so this was when you know Rich Nichols um, made his soul rest he uh, connect me with him and um, we um, basically booked it where I just was like uh, I just wanted Black Thought, I think. I thought Rock Him and Black Thought would have been that was such a great lyrical combo, you know. I mean, there's also on the bill was Brand Nubian, Keith right. Murray, who, a lot of uh, Just Dice. Top five, two of their top five. Yeah, right Homeboy Sandman performed. Um, Shout out to Homeboy Sandman. It's a great friend of mine. Yeah. Do you know he helped me move into my studio? He, no, I didn't. Like, what a great guy. Like, how many people will help you do that? Like, literally, dude helped me, like, carry boxes into the studio. Yeah, I yeah, I got a lot of respect for him. I'd love to... He's a brilliant MC. He is, yeah. And he, I, I feel like that period of time, too, at the Ninny Factory, he was really working out a bunch of stuff. And not to get too tangential on that last night, which is totally fine, the thing with Homeboy Sam and what I remember about him so well, and you captured so many photos of him uh, during this period of time is that he came to the club one time very early on, and you might have even shot one of those shows. Um, they did a small show, and he was like, how do I get up to the main space? Like, how do I work my way up to headlining that? You know, like, and we basically collaborated in a way where, you know, very decisively built shows with him as the promoter, working his way to, to be able to headline that room, which he did, I think, twice. And uh, through also with his collective of artists um, at the time, uh, which was really cool because he, he was a tenacious promoter. He would get on the, I forgot what train lines he hit, but he was like a train promoter, you know, hitting uh, people with flyers on the train and posting them up on the little things up top on the train. And it paid off. And like, I think in part that hard work and the success from that period of time is why he got on Stone's Throw, why he's put out multiple records and toured like, you know, countless times. He's an times. intelligent dude. He's an intelligent dude. And I, lo I love people who push the parameters creatively. Like, if you think Absolutely. about, like, uh, you know, talk about, like, you guys had Stetsasonic there and Prince Paul. You know, you talk about Prince Paul, whose music is just so unique and, and creative and his own, you know, and you had Brand Nubian there. You talk about, you know, the MCs of Brand Nubian. Um, just people, you know, as we go back in the history of hip-hop, it seems like people had had real unique styles, and there was not as much, you know, um, um, inspiration or biting as, he, as, as, you know, back in the day. Like, you know, yours was your own. You know, even though there were early, early styles of, of MC and were very similar at the time um, you know it's just for me it's been a real honor to you know it's just an honor that I'm I get to be in the in where I'm at you know I got a front row seat to to some of the most brilliant musicians you know and I yeah bro I'll bring my camera in there and they're like okay right this way Rob and you know there's either a pit you know back at you know when you're shooting those small venues you know it's just like sometimes you're crowded in and like elbowing your way to the front um but to there, try to move around and get different pictures so you're not like st stuck in the front of the stage the whole night yeah the knitting factory had a very particular kind of makeup so how how do you remember the backstage of the knitting factory you know, if you look at the pictures, a lot of times I would just like bring the backdrop backstage, and I would try to get some shots on stage. But if it was too crowded, you couldn't really go. Like the Rock M show, like I couldn't leave backstage because if I left, I wouldn't get back in. Right. Definitely, you had you were around. kind of like in the. See, there was periods of time when you shot. Uh, there's it was like you had to enter. Typically, you would enter from the balcony and then walk down a rickety staircase to get to the stage. So there's basically two little rooms that you are stationed in. It was either essentially the backstage and then there was like a loading room right before the stage, you know, like uh, that was, it's like two levels. Where did you find that purple paint? Like who the hell, like that, <laughs> no that paint color, like who who was in this paint shop? Like, you know what? I'll take that one. It was like, <laughs> like if you look at the picture, like what is that color? I'm not sure if it's even... A color like it's a combination of Pantone <laughs> mixtures that it doesn't even exist anywhere on earth. But wait, I want to say like seeing Black Thought and Rakim in that small venue. Yeah. Like when you see a when you see an artist who's like, you know, can fill a stadium with people because they're just so damn talented and dope. 
legendary cats. Yo, I'm um, saying. In a venue, like how many people could fit in there? Like 600? No, I mean, a sold out show would be 500 in the main 500 space. 500 people. And that it's would a be a small packed. club, you know? Yeah. 500 just, would be really it's an packed. It's intimate small club, and it's like, you, you know, you think about the jazz photography of like Herman Leonard uh-huh. when he's in this small club, and it's like Dizzy Gillespie just playing his horn or something. Yeah. Like crazy shit like that. Like, it's cool. It's cool because I, I think it's a. I'm not sure you're going to catch these guys, you know, on a rare occasion someone might get on the mic, but like at this point in time, you know, playing these small venues, like there's a picture of Black Thought, like, and it's a small, it's just a small crowd, like to to, to see Rakim in, in a, you know, in a in an intimate setting, you know, where it's. Well, yeah, that was the whole. It's like yeah. a personal show. It's just, oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's a trip too because, uh. Um, because of the people and the characters, you know. So you listen know. to this. Okay. Like, so we at the Duck Down show, you're like, "Yo, um, can you send me those pictures?" And and to bring it back to the technology, yeah. With digital photography, right? You shoot them. You can edit them that night. And some nights I'd have them up that night or the next day. Uh-huh. I'd rush them I remember. out. Yeah. And then so everyone's I'd be very looking anxious to, and excited yeah. to see them. You know everyone saying? wants to see the pictures from the night before. Right. And then, you know, if you got them out quick, yours would end up on Brooklyn Vegan quicker or right. like, uh, uh, you know, in the early days, Jake Payne of Hip Hop DX, who really grew Hip Hip Doc DX from, it was like this small kind of beige blog, like they they never even credited me. I, I, and I spoke to Jake about it. I called him up and said, hey, you guys don't really credit me. He's like, well... It's because it's because of the layout. There's no space to put you in there. I said, "Well, if you wouldn't mind, I'd appreciate it if you could figure that out." Right. This was a longer conversation, and Jake was a gentleman about it. And we've been friends since that conversation. Um, shout out Jake, by the way, uh, who's now at Ambrosia for Heads. Um, okay, okay. Uh, with Reggie, shout out Reg. Right. Um, but you know, so you'd, you'd shoot the That's pictures, and they'd be they'd be up the next day or two days later. Right. So it was really cool, and that that's not something you do with film because in film you develop and then shoot pics and maybe scan them, right? You know, so the, the technology changed the game to to where it's like people could really access the shows in the next days, and now we can see streams and videos and 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 sort of get a feeling that that we're in a place or right. a space where we're not. Right. So it's real cool how the technology changed all that, you know. So yeah, it's just I real agree. unique to the time. Yeah, I mean, uh, and yeah. Last tell thing, me, tell me. So we shot the duck down show, and then I'll shut up. And then you're like, "Yo, can you email these to me?" And you gave me your email, and then I'm like, "Oh wait, I had your email because I had done a shoot for I think Juice Magazine with Sadat X." Oh yeah, <laughs> and I was like, "Wait, Peter, this is you. Like, we know each other from the Sadat X pictures. I think it was either Juice Magazine or Acclaim Magazine." Yeah, uh, Juice was, um, where was that from? It wasn't a U.S. Magazine. Germany, Juice yeah, is a yeah. German publication. It was that. I think it was for that. Because I remember when Sadat lived on Riverside Drive, but way uptown is where he shot yeah. it. And, and basically by his building. Yeah. And he had, I remember it well. Yeah. I remember the photos well. And I remember going to his house. And I, I you know, um, it was just like, that was one of my early magazine shoots. Yeah, it was during a period of time when we did. A, I did two albums with Sadat on my label, uh, "Experience in Education" and "Black October." And that photos, the photos that you did was during the Black October period of time, which was um, yeah, which you shot the cover. I did not shoot the cover of that one. Um, oh, a German guy in Berlin. Sadat and I were in Berlin, and we were backstage, and a guy I backstage you shot snapped that. that. I shot the, there was a 12 inch cover of, of, of Sadat's that I shot for a single called What Did I Do? Oh. I shot the photo for that. Yeah. And, yeah, because um, I was like, is this, what is this guy, a photographer or what is he? <laughs> yeah, low key. Yeah. Uh, I love photography. You know, I love taking photos, man. And I still got the, you know, I still get busy with my Canon E1 like, on occasion. I wish I shot more film, but, you know, Instagram and shit fuck that all up, you know. So. But anyway, I want to get a little more specific <laughs> with these shows, though. Uh, and, and it's so hard because there's so many. But, you know, to just to break down, like, what we did during the period of time and a quick rundown, too, so that people kind of get a better sense. 
you know, yes, it did start with the boot camp thing, which we did, and, and Torre, which we did kind of uh, talk about a little bit. From there, some memorable ones for me was um, I did a, after, I, I tried to attempt to do a um, uh, after party for the Puerto Rican Day Parade uh, with the Beat Nuts, Powell Rule, Gab Gotcha, and JS1. And that was my. Uh, that's how I built it and promoted it. I didn't. I booked it all separately. Shout out stuff. to, to uh, JS One and Johnny Walker and, and uh, yeah, Jack, Johnny Walker, Jack Daniels, Jack Daniels. backstage yeah. all the time talking and great talking guys, hip hop. Right. They were regulars for sure at the shows. Um, I remember that one well. Uh, Power Rule played, and he hadn't done a show in a long time. And uh, yeah, JS One was a uh, was, was a great um, terminology at that show. He might have been. Yeah, we'd have to. F- Flip through all these flicks. I think terminology, terminology might, have, quite a bit. might have, uh, you know, and he was very organized. Like all his dudes had shirts and shit like that. I oh yeah, he had a plan. He that, came right? in with a plan, big time. I think that was the first time I met Term. Um, yes. Or I might have. Yeah, but I think that was the first time I met Term. Shout out Term, Static Selector. Yeah, another really extremely memorable one was uh, Q-Tip headlining. Uh, basically an, an invite only show um, as an album release for his solo record The Renaissance and um, I was particularly thrilled to have scored this show and I basically got it because there was a guy from Universal Records named Scott that started coming to the club and he was there for some other show and I was like yo how do we get that I want that Q-tip show you know like you gotta get it because Q-Tip solo is in a, uh, it doesn't play solo very often. And you captured this night from start to finish, and it was an incredible show. Brought out, the, you know, you mentioned this earlier, DJ Scratch, who, who's his touring DJ as well. But Busta Rhymes, Consequence, and this is all like before this album came out. And the Q-Tip show in New York City always has a very special. Yeah, I mean, for it. you to get an artist that big into that venue that's a that's yeah. a get yeah because he could have easily played like a webster hall Yo, or he could have opened up at a yeah much bigger if they would have spent a bunch of time like really pushing it this was like nice and intimate and there was like a line down the street you know to get in and uh he had the lumberman uh lumberjack uh uh gear on and shit as yeah, you see. know these he are was, iconic photos i mean that was kind of, he was you know talk about fashion he was early rocking that style in terms oh, yeah, of hip hop guys, I think maybe maybe a good two years before that started, yeah, catching on. Yeah, definitely. I remember this show well because he left his wallet at the club and someone stole it. Oh, that and sucks. And the next day, he like had it on in stage. In El Segundo, <laughs> it might as well have been. The backstage felt like you were in another universe. Um, I think it was on stage during the show, and I think someone quickly so zipped up and yeah, because. We tried to desperately tried to find it the next day, um, uh, later that night oh, as that well. Sucks, man. Yeah, I remember that well because he just tore the house down, and it was. A, if you look at these photos, and hopefully, you know, in the intro and the outro of, of this show we're doing right now, I'm going to tell people the link if that's cool with you for them to peep these out. Yeah, while. and you know, I leave these up. I've, I've left these up for the past ten years, so um, so that people can enjoy them. Yeah. Definitely. And this was such an incredible show, and I think that it represents a very special period of time, I think, in Q-Tip's career, and um, it was... Yeah, Busta was the surprise. People didn't... Yes, and you know what? Let Busta came off, and of course, they did Scenario, and... Um, People went berserk. Yeah, it was incredible. I love that. And then I was able to do a Busta Rhymes show, headlining show, I missed, just like I this. I missed some shows, man. And it was difficult. Well, you, you know, couldn't I be tr- at all of them. I, mean, I tried to come, you know, you try to go to everything, and you just can't. Right. You just can't. And now that I have kids, like, people are like, yo, where are you? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have to put my kids to sleep and get them to school and wake up at 6.30 in the morning. Like, right. you know, you know, I have a family. So it's like, if it's not a paid gig, it's like, it's kind of tough right. to say to my wife, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to the show till 2 in the morning. You know, and then no, wake up and really sick. That. Like, you know, things do change. So if you're a young photographer, I say, you know, get out there and, and you know, 
that time of your life really is precious. Oh yeah, dude. Go I mean, to all like, the shows, shoot as much as you can, meet meet as many people as you can. One thing that's crazy, by the way, shout out Tanya Morgan. I know. Yes. I can't really. You don't want to forget. Um, uh, you know. Uh, those guys. No, because they played a lot too. Both. I would see them and all the time. Opening. And they're dope as fuck. And she did a great Souls of Mischief show with Tanya Morgan, and Don Will, and, you know all the guys. Yes. Yes. Uh, who else? Um, what else do you remember, man? What was your favorite show? You know, for me, you know, my brother had Follow the Leader, and he's and I heard heard that album. Um, so that show was a big deal for me. And you know, the Q Tip, you know, Q Tip is the man. Like I remember when uh, Can I Kick It came on the radio when yeah. I was when I was up in college in Syracuse. And I was like, wow, I can't believe my shit's on the radio. <laughs> you know, there was a time, you know, you know, and I, I don't want to mess up the history, but like, so you would be able to hear it on, you know, Stretch and Bob. I used to drive my car on Palisades to hear the Stretch and Bob show oh. because it, it wouldn't, you, it's the only way you could get it. Like it, it reached my car. Right. Um, so... You know, but on mainstream radio, you know, from the period after Run DMC, you know, 1983, 84 and stuff like that, there was a time where a lot of hip hop wasn't being played on the radio. And th and then, you know, it was like um, Tribe Called Quest with Can I Kick It brought that back again, yeah. you know, and uh, I remember hearing that on the radio. So I got to photograph... Um, you know, from from everybody starting to meet me, I started to get hired for magazine covers, and and uh, you know, Large Professor was one of the early guys who trusted me. You know, with some album art, Tanya Morgan as well. That's why I mentioned them. Mm -hmm. um, also, from the people in the stairs, that 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 picture went into Beyond Race magazine, mm -hmm. and then I met uh, you know David. Um, and then from Beyond Race magazine, and he, you know that. Then I shot J Cole for the J Cole's first magazine cover for Word? for Beyond Race magazine. So a lot of stuff. From that people on the Sierra show. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. It's like I was kind of a snob in terms of like shooting events or shows and stuff. Like I was like, photography is art and portraiture is art because you're set. And but like you know. I don't know. I, I don't know. I my I had a very closed minded view of of um, what photography and art was. You know, right. I was kind of a snob about it, and I was just going to these shows because I could. And then you know it was funny. You mentioned Psycho Less, like a, sh a show at Studio B. I ended up going on stage with Psycho Less and Juju, and I wasn't supposed to be there. But, like, all of a sudden, like, I had this professional gear, and I was on stage, and people thought I was supposed to be there. <laughs> nice. Which was similar to, like, some of the shows. Like, I just kind of show up and kind of... Well, they started trusting you. They, the people trusted you, too. And you have, like, an affable personality. They, you know, they registered it. And, in fact, you know, that little world that was in the backstage of the, of the Knitting Factory was like a family that existed for a while. It's funny, because when I see... Uh, some of those guys, some of the regulars, um, and I'm looking at the very last photo of your that you ever posted from the last show that you shot, which was Sav Kills, Sav Skills, and Jay Ronan. I don't know; these two guys were there all the time, and they're still doing. I just saw Sav like at this boat party uh, I did with Peanut Butter Wolf and Prince Paul with CX Kidtronic and Sav are doing a record and they just happen to be at this thing and they're like yo man I see you since a knit and that was a lineup of one of your other shows pretty much it was just yeah. add Eden and you're good yeah yeah it was Gary that, that was Gary Wilson uh, Peanut Butter Wolf yeah Eden CX Kidtronic also shout out to Dwayne Harriet uh, yeah so I, I know we're going all over the place with it but yo I like that project that Eden just did with um um Droog and the dude from Rat King. Oh, Wiki. Wiki. Yeah, it's dope. Yo. It's great. That, that, shout out to you fellas. That shit was dope. Thank if you. I was still doing the Knitting Factory to this day, I would have... Uh, you know what? I saw them play at the Brooklyn Knitting Factory. It's quite good. The three of those cats. 
eat on your uh, your old Droog and yo, you wicked. guys don't realize you three together kind of capture that fucking uh, that kind of beasties vibe and that shit is dope and you guys should do a whole album. Yeah, for sure. I co well, talking that to idea. you, Droog. Love to talk about uh, my. I had a birthday party at the Netting Factory that you shot as well. My twenty ninth. Yeah, thank you. By the way, recently. Yes, it was. Yeah, October thirtieth. Um, this was my twenty ninth birthday. The one that we shot at the Netting Factory. I'm thirty eight years old now. By the way, so. Uh, it's so funny. I think of you as older than me, but I'm older than you. Maybe it's because you're more mature and you were in that position of like you were in charge of the net. So well, I, kinda, I started. I kind of thought of you as like. You know, but I'm an immature person, generally yeah. speaking. <laughs> so, well, you said, I mean, when you started talking keep about keep going, the, talk about the music. Well, when you were talking about the summer, Sam, I mean, like, you're obviously got a little bit older than me because I would love to know about that. That sounds fascinating to me, but I mean, I was five years old. Right. I mean, that's, that's terrifying. Though. Just, I don't really know. I can't. Do you remember the news from that time? I, you know, very vaguely. I do remember seeing Nixon on TV, I think he was getting impeached. And, uh, um, you know, I barely, I barely even know. Do you know, I was very young. I just sure. remember when I was five, I remember the house very well. And when I went back and shot B-roll for, for the Drez Jaleel Shaw video, mm-hmm. um, Energy, Flight Energy, which is dope, by the way. If you want to you check out a real, good, a real good marriage of jazz and hip-hop, which is really hard to do. Yes. You know, shout out to Guru. But, um, Who you shot as well. Let's talk about him in a second, too. Um, you know, shout out to Gangstar and the Foundation. Um, shout out to Primo. But you know, I lost my train of thought. I was talking about, <laughs> I was talking about legends. Yeah, I know it's easy. You know what? I've been watching on. This is getting really tangential, but I've been watching a ton of Late Night with David Letterman from like eighty two to eighty three, eighty four, eighty five. These shows they're on YouTube. There's several like full episodes. And it's such an amazing slice of New York. Like the people that are on, because it's so freeform. It's this before it was, he had the, uh, it was late yeah. night with David I Lennon. used to stay up and watch that. Yeah. And it was real loose and playful and like, like the comedy and stuff like that. Yeah. And the guest, he would bring up just regular New Yorkers. You know what I'm saying? Like I watched one last night where they did this gag where basically they were calling the payphone waiting for someone to pick it up and whoever picked it up they just invite him on up and onto the show it was a payphone it was a booth of payphones that was like whatever outside of where yeah, the studio I remember was. that yeah and this guy picked it up um, Tony was his name and he was drinking a beer in a tall can in a paper bag with a straw like a true New Yorker and uh, they invited him up to the show and he had just gotten off work and um, he was from Queens and he was drinking his tall can in a bag with a straw in the guest chair and they just like talked about his job and you know it's just it's just like so new york which you know nowadays it's just it's so nostalgic to look back in a way i kind of feel like that when i'm looking at your photos too and how you know to see like some of these guys that i i I used to hang out with so often that i don't see that much more like it's so hard because i feel like we're leaving out like i know i'm gonna run into you know someone from that time and and well who comes to mind we can just start naming names no i just don't want to forget anyone like these are all our lives like you know like at the end of this time period Mm -hmm. i had okay so b and h photography um B and H photo store has these big bags when you'd buy like a, a you know, a, a big thing of printing paper. Uh-huh. They're kinda like now like those big target bags. Right. Anyway, I had a bag full of business cards. Uh-huh. Oh, because from other I, people. No, from everyone I met at the knitting right. factory. Every <laughs> every night I would meet it could through that that pass through that area. Yeah, it could have yeah. been anywhere from twenty to forty people and on, on any one of those nights and I had a huge bag right, of business right, cards right. and finally I was like I gotta throw these out right you know I had big plans so I'm gonna I'm gonna enter these all into my email right. I'm gonna save them I'm gonna reach out and do some work with these people you know cause I met everybody yeah. through there and and you know a lot of times at that time I would meet so many people backstage like I would be out and someone would come to me like yo Rob how's it going man it's good to see you again and I'd be like <laughs> yeah 
I would just say like, oh yeah, I remember it was at the knitting factory, but I didn't remember because we like, I, I met so many people. Right, and on any given night, it was like basically like a conveyor belt of people getting their photos taken by you. So, and most of these cats are drinking all, as much free alcohol as they possibly can get their hands on too. And you know, it's like a party. People By the way, a lot blunts. of people would never recognize me if I didn't have my camera on my neck or a hat on, you know, right, right. because it was like, it would be like, you know, or I'd see someone and I wouldn't have my camera or I'd show up to a show and be like, yo, where's your camera? I was like, Oh, I, I just want to hear some hip hop. <laughs> right, I just right. want to hear some hip hop. Like I went right. to, a, I went to a rock cam show in studio B and it was raining and there was no one there. And uh, Uncle Ralph did it, and it was like, I think it was like Starsky. He did a couple shows out at Studio B. Right. And I remember one, like Chuck D did something one night. Anyway, I saw Rock Cam at this small venue. I think, I think, uh, I think uh, Uncle Ralph put it on. I didn't know Ralph that well at the time, mm -hmm. but the show was like, since it was ro really cold and raining, a lot of people stayed home, and it was like a private rock cam concert. Like, like I, I'd say, I don't know, there might have been a hundred people. Dope, there. dope. So, and this is after the knit has closed, right? Or Studio B is around the same time. DJ Jedi was there, by okay. the way, Jedi, because he knew every fucking lyric more than me. Uh -huh. Like, I'm a, I'm a rock cam fan, but yeah. like, dude, literally knew probably like. 99% of the lyric to the point where Rakim actually was like pointed him out and said thank you wow like, you know but like um shout out to Jedi by the way but um I I went up to Ralph and I just hugged him after that night and I think he was like take it easy dude <laughs> no, he was just like, "Why is this grown man hugging me?" You know, it right. was awkward, right. but I but like I I couldn't believe how 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 dope the show was. Right. I will say this too. I think Starsky we, was spinning too. Like yeah, it was crazy. He was, at the, he was at the Nice and Smooth show, both of them. And probably one of my most fondest memories, I think, of the Knitting Factory and the shows that you shot was at that Nice and Smooth show because um, uh, Ralph McDaniels was there. It was my birthday and he fil he was filming me for his show, for his cable access show. So he goes, it's yeah, it's birthday. so cool to see and, Uncle Ralph coming out and doing yeah, And bringing the camera. And I remember just being like, yo, dude, you did that for Biggie's birthday. Because he, he interviewed Biggie, uh, Notorious B.I.G., on his birthday, on his on Ralph McDaniel's show. And I was just like, you know, so yeah, over the moon. Really a, a, um, he's really a legend and a, um, you know, you know, talk about like the beginnings of music videos. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah. And a pioneer in music videos. Absolutely. And, and um, a, uh, a brilliant video music video director in his own right. Yeah, definitely. He's just a p parameter pushing, you know, um, father of of uh, of documentary uh, work. And, yeah, and he's still know, doing like stuff. His archive is just like untouchable. Right. What about this guy? Remember this guy? Oh, Peter Rosenberg. Shout out Peter Rosenberg. Shout I remember Peter Rosenberg. Her, I think um, P Peter got hired by the Redskins. Ninety seven. Sure. Um, there was a uh, Flex did a uh, July fourth episode where like he Flex was like, I think he just stayed the whole night. Like his whatever his show was and. He just, he did a, um, it was a July 4th show. Okay. And I think you can access it online. All right. But Peter Rosenberg was, like, coming up to Hot 97, and I think he had gotten the job already. And they're, like, and you can hear Flex. Flex was even busting Peter Ro Peter's um, chops. He's, like, he's, like, I think he's, I think he said something. Flex was, like, what do you know about, what do you know about, like, Big L or something like that? And, you know, Peter knows his shit, so I think he was yeah. like, come on. He's like, are you testing me? He's like, shout out Big L and stuff like that. But it was a great show. Like, it, it was really like an OG hip-hop um, mix. There's like four parts, so it's huge. Go check it out. I think it's online. Uh, but Peter would come, come by and support a lot of independent hip-hop. And right, he right. was always, you know, with his late show, he always supports 
um, you know, good independent hip hop, which is great and important. And, and a shout out to Peter for doing that and, and helping put guys on because I think a lot of guys, you know, um, you know, will get the get get the you know the dream radio job and yeah. and you know it's it's difficult to do that. You have to go out of your way to do that, you know, and, and put in that effort. And yeah. Peter was at these shows. And um, he and ho- I through. hired him a couple times to host, and in particular, I know he was the host for Jay with the Damager and Daz Effects because I think I also had Homeboy Sandman or AO Collective on that. Um, and yeah, Rosenberg, he's the dude, man. We used to, I used to bring some rappers to the tapings of his late night shows to prom- and as a way to plug the Knitting Factory shows. So I brought, uh, I got Lord Finesse there, Brand Nubian among others but yeah i got a lot of respect for peter so and he was a part of that that mini factory family too for a while what about this cat do you know who this is can you recognize this is a little more of a, this might be a little more obscure for you but i'm not this is a beautiful photo though i love this photo you took of this cat this is during the ditc shows ditc the legion craig g my man Sean Rollins and BC, they were the house DJs for the night up in the balcony. This guy came through, affiliated with Gangstar. Testing your hip hop knowledge here, Photo Rob. You put you you testing me. I'm putting you on blast. Interviews over. <laughs> no, Smiley the Ghetto Child is this one. Oh yeah, uh, affiliated yeah, 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 with yeah. Gangstar and Group Home. Um, you had some great pictures of, of you know that I do too. need some help. Like well, I you know. I, you know, we've spoken about doing a book about with, with this work. Yes. And I'm going to need some help in terms of like, um, there's some OGs that I, I don't even know who they are. Oh my God, trust me, I know. There's a lot of people looking back at these where I'm like, they weren't performers, but like, for example, like with the Rock Hem show, there was this guy here with the yellow shirt. There's a one of the last photos you took. It's Rock Hem with my, my friend with the yellow t shirt. He was a travel agent, and I would buy. Uh, this is when you would use travel agents to buy flight, help you buy flights and stuff. But you wouldn't do it online. And he was good friends. He was like best friends with Scoob from Daz Effect. So him and Scoob would come as right, just like Cycle Less, and we'd just hang out. And uh, you know, uh, they would be there to, for the jam. You know, and he would help me buy flights when I'd fly. I try to fly some rappers in for shows. Um, you know, um, one night. It might have been uh, the DOS Effects show. I'm not sure. Anyway, I'm backstage, and I used to have rhyme sheets, right? I, I mean, wanted were to you be right, You were writing rhymes. I, I had rhyme sheets. What, you brought some rhymes to the show? I sure did. Because <laughs> I, I wanted I wanted to uh, be a rapper. No, but I had rhyme sheets, and I, and I had dreams of being a rapper when I was young. Sure, so, of course. Of course. So... If we didn't move out of Queens, by the way, I think I would have probably been in Def Jux, or I would have been a B boy because because Walden Hahn and I were trying to break dance in his basement um, in 1983. Wow! To uh, run the MC joints, I think I might have been a B boy though because I was really more into the the B boying. Really, it was like I was like it's just so cool. I was like I wanted to learn that and I can backspin and pop and shit a little bit. Did you go to Rocksteady jams? Um, I started to go on to Rock City Jams a little bit later. Right. But um, anyway, long story short, like I was backstage and I, uh, and I was like, there was a gentleman there. I was like, yo, and I started to freestyle a little bit. I'm like, can you freestyle? Can you rhyme? And he's like, yeah, I can a little bit. And so I'm doing my shitty freestyle. And then he's about to start. You know, we were just fucking around with the beat there. And then somebody comes over to me with the camera and was just like, Yo, Scoob, can you give me a drop? <laughs> and I'm like, Oh my God, that's that's Scoob from Das Effects. I'm such, I'm such an idiot. I'm such an idiot. No, man. That's so cool. it was really funny. It was really funny. Like, right. There was just some, some great moments. That Yo, I, I regret. Them. I regret. Um, great guy, by the way. Shout oh, out to Scoob. Super man. cool. Yeah. And they Indeed. destroyed that show, too. Incredible still, Das Effects. Um, I really regret not getting my photo taken with a lot of these cats, too, because it's funny now we live in the, in, uh, the age of Instagram. I kind of would shit. stop you sometimes. Be like, yo, take a picture. But, you know, honestly, Peter, like I remember you were you were always in motion going up and down stairs because, you know, it's just, very, you know, like it, you didn't really have time because you were dealing with a lot of issues. Yeah. Well, I was working. I mean, you know, 
I yeah, was hanging like out, putting with out them. fires, like you know, yeah, someone drank all the Heinekens, or you know, like, <laughs> like there's a there's a sound there's a sound issue, and you got to communicate right. to some the sound, and it's like it's not like you guys had radios or anything. You had to go up to the office and deal with something, or to the right. soundboard, which was which was upstairs. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, definitely. No, there was a lot of issues. Like, and I was telling you this before, but you know, someone died in the club during one of my hip hop shows. Uh, someone smoked crack in the club. I got in trouble for that. Someone was smoking. They were either smoking crack or some sort of like dust or something like that in the middle of the audience. Um, it was just a concert goer, but I, I remember the show it was Cormega and AZ together. And Damn. Um, um, I remember because AZ was one. walking Damn. around the club with a what bottle a of show. Grey Goose. Shout out to Cormega. Man. Yo, they killed it. I mean, but it was. Uh, there was a, some lunatic in the middle of the club, like, you know, smoking dust or whatever. He was smoking something that really stuck. Yeah, I got kicked out. That was me. No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. I'm joking. That's not something funny to joke Right. About. I don't even think you were drinking beers back then. I mean, you were strictly, I mean, just, I mean, you were working too. So, I mean, you had to stay focused. But, I mean, Cass was getting bent backstage. I mean, yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing. is up. like, I was there to work. Yes. You know, and... You know, I'm not one of those guys that can do good exposures when I'm high and stuff. It's like mathematics and stuff. And so, you know, yeah, I know. Yeah. No, it doesn't no. help me. It doesn't help me when I'm shooting. I fly no. straight. Some photographers really I rely fly on straight. I don't, uh, I'm not a big partier these days. I used to right. be. Oh, okay. But, you know, I got hmm. kids now. I'm an old man. Yeah, no, I know. I know. Yeah. That's why we're reflecting back on your wild and crazy days at the Knitting Factory. Um, another one that I'd love to talk about really quickly is that I, you know, I helped uh, sort of do this residency called the Low End Theory. Very, very well known and established Los Angeles weekly in LA at a club called the Airliner. But for a, a period of time, I think maybe six months, we did it once a month in New York at the Knitting Factory with Daddy Kev. Shout out to Daddy Kev, who I kind of coordinated it all with. They would fly in and fly back the next morning, all from L.A. with different... It was like residents who were at the time was... It was Nobody, D. Styles, Gas Lamp Killer, and Daddy Kev, and No Can Do. And um, the very first one we did was with Flying Lotus, who would go on to obviously become quite popular and got some Grammys under his belt and all that. Uh, but it's funny Ooh, to... What a, what a what nice... Uh Flying Lotus is a, is a nice band, and, and D Styles too. Like, I just remember oh, yeah. talking to D, to, to D Styles backstage, and he was just so present and listening to me, and I was just so taken by his spirit. Um, well, that was one where it was like, hey, because I remember, I think I asked you, I'm like, Rob, do you, would you be down to come and shoot this? Because these guys don't come to New York very often. It would be a good one to kind of document, too. It wasn't the Didn't traditional. Did the Flying Lotus open up for another show? And his, he DJed from the crowd? Like, on ta his table was set up? Nah, you're thinking of when I did Gary Wilson with Wolf, uh, DJ Dwayne DJed on the floor. Okay, so that um, wasn't, wasn't Lotus. No, Lotus. I'm pretty. I'm quite certain was from the stage. Also, another mainstay backstage and a great New York promoter. I want to tell a funny story yeah. from Flying Lotus. By the way, you had a Please. sound guy that was kind of. He was just pissed off all the time. Yes, I recall. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't want to. You know, if he's listening, by the way, I, I love guarantee you he's not listening. But. but like, he was fucking angry, bro. Right. Well, like he was he pissed off all the time. So I would just know, like. Don't fuck with the guy. Stay out of that guy's right. way. Because, like, he was just pissed off. And he looked like he was ready to, do, to to kind of, like, explode on you. And he was not... He was just angry. He was just a very angry person. Yep. I um, know who you're talking about. Anyway, so... Flying Lotus comes in and he's doing a sound check with the guy. And... The guy's just angry. And he's like, yeah, yeah, just... Uh, Talking to Flying Lotus, who's on stage trying to get the levels right, and he's like, "Yo, bring this up a little." And the guy is just really angry. Flying Lotus goes like this. I'm like, "Oh no!" I'm like, "What's gonna happen?" Angry guy is—is is, is this the night that he's just his brain's gonna have a nuclear explosion uh -huh. and just fucking <laughs> kill somebody? Uh -huh. And Flying Lotus goes, "Sound man," he's on stage pointing up, up there. And he goes, "Sound man, I don't know what you're going through, but I love you." Wow. 
and that's all he said and like then they figured out the, the he just he just hit him with love instead of reacting negatively right which I think is brilliant and and like um it's the right way to do that I mean he's just a love bomb so he just hit him with a love bomb and then they figured out the um I just remember that I was just you know I'm just taken by people also the sound check Diamond D shout out Diamond D digging in the crates shout out to everybody and digging in the crates like by the way digging in the crates like what's a deeper production crew than that like do you know how yeah. fucking talented that crew is well that was a special show we did too it's just unbelievable yeah, absolutely of course I mean that's why I put it together you know we had to fly Diamond in for that because he doesn't live in New York and I remember picking him up and taking him to the hotel and Party Artie, who was affiliated with uh, Showbiz and AG, and um, he had just passed away, like right a few days before that show, and no he way. was like very much a part of the DITC family. Um, and uh, Ghetto Dwellers was, was his group that was typically produced by Show, um, and uh, so that sh- that concert was a, definitely a tribute to him. I remember Big L's brother came to that show as well. If people wow. know who that is. Um, yeah, it was just a classic wow. night, you know, uh, like so many others. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, we could go on and on and but on. But at the sound check, you know, that knitting factory space was difficult to get the sound good because it was real just bassy. Right. You know, and, the, and, and like, the shape of the room was kind of like this weird, like... It was a weird room. It was a shape. It was a weird shape. It was just not, like, a normal shape. So it was tough to get sound, and I just remember Diamond D working out the levels um, with your sound engineer, and the room sounded like incredible. Dope. Okay. And I was just standing there, and you know, you could when you stand backstage, you could look through the stage door and, and just kind of catch the stage. And Diamond D was standing on stage, and the door was open, and. Like that backstage door was open, and you you were like, never open this door, whatever you do, because like you could you could literally go straight from the crowd area right backstage. So like yeah. you were like, don't open the door. And there was that cool security guy that uh, we would always have conversations. Which one do you remember him? Uh, he was just a cool guy with dreads, tall guy. Yeah, and then I, I just he always looked, drank tequila and pineapple juice. I was so. looking at at Diamond D, and I, I heard how great the space sounded. It was just crisp and fucking booming, and I was like, "Oh, of course, Diamond D, Diamond D is a musical genius." I was just like, "Wow, okay." Yeah, so he, he just in. knows what he's doing. Yeah. how to make that space sound so good. Uh, so I, there was just some cool moments like that where I was real impressed, and um, you know, a lot of these a lot of these meetings led to to later projects. I just recently did uh, the Summon a Man cover for for Diamond D and Sadat X. Did you? Yeah. Oh, that's what's up. Nice. And you shot um, Sadat many times at the Knitting Factory. And it happened based on you know I'd I'd, I'd tag some of the photos because. Um, those photos were pre having the photo Rob tag, which was done by DG. Shout out to to DG and uh, also BL out there in uh, Queens. Uh, DG who passed away mm. it was a graffiti artist, and he did the um, the tag. So it was before the tag. So I, I went back and added the tag to the, to those to those pictures of digging it in the crates. And Diamond D was on Twitter. He's like, "Yo, why are you tagging my flicks?" And so I DM'd Time T and I said, oh, you know, I was shooting those shows. Those are, are pictures that I took. Mm-hmm. You know, much respect. I'm a big fan of your work. And if you ever want to do something, you know, let me know. He's like, well, I'm working on this project with Sadat X. So a lot of the relationships that, you know, chance meetings from, from the club ended up turning into to projects. Which yeah, is, I love it. I love that, man. Which is, you know, I'm so grateful for. You yeah. Know, and it's like really, you know... My intentions were just to document the music I love. And, and of course. These brilliant, these brilliant artists. Yeah, okay. So there's so many ways to go. One thing I remember so much from this era, too, is the fashion. A lot of these guys had, it was like still the era, like the all over print shirts and like, you know, super colorful. I feel like people have like kind of gotten a lot more like simple with their fashion um, in the years that have followed. You know, which is kind of a trip. And the jeans, uh, and the sneakers are still kind of like the Air Force Ones and uh, trainers. 
Yeah, because I'm, because you you know this is a time capsule, so you see a lot of the trends that have come and gone. Um, but yeah, man, alcoholics. There's you know so much going on Z-Man. there. Yeah, shout out to my man Z Man. Now also, by the way, I want to shout out um, from you know Tiny Morgan. I want to shout out the legendary guys. Also, I really got to shout out Ducktown Music, man. Shout them out. Shout, who like, do Because you, you you had a lot of connections with people, so let's get let's get some shout outs out there, man. I, I, mean, know, I met. Fuck. I really connected with Ducktown Music at this time, and like their whole crew is just like they're all brilliant. They're all fucking cool as shit. And they make great music, it's, and it's just like um, Smith and Wesson, Sean Price, um, also the guys that were involved, like Kids in the Hall. Yes, uh, were involved with them. We at that them. Time. They did it, several shows. Um, um, but, but working with Noah and Drew Hot, were they were really great organized. We did a lot of stuff. We did Black Moon with a live band, which was really remarkable. We did uh, shout out to Marco Polo too. Yeah, Double Marco Battle. Polo. Um, who else? Yeah, okay. If we're gonna be s- just sitting here saying uh, yeah, shout outs, shout, I don't know. Is that I, no? I got some people. I, I just like to, to make I like sure. to acknowledge as well. You know? I mean, this is really your whole thing. Like I, I was just living in your world at that time. Well, yeah. I want to interview you, Peter, for this show because you can like, if you like. I mean, I just want to say like one thing about those shows was that was so great was that you really did balance the OGs with. You know, like having some of the newer acts, right. and and it's like um, it was just like it's like real good hip hop, and to and to have like and it was it was not a small venue and it was not a big venue, so it was sort of perfect to be able to do that. Right, right. Because when it was full, it was it felt like it was bigger. You it felt like it was like the biggest thing happening in the city that night. Yo, yeah. shout out to Ill Mind, by the way. Like I was in the basement and, and DJ Eclipse. Like oh, I yeah. met DJ Eclipse. DJ like Eclipse. we I would go like you'd go down in the basement and some of these shows were like down in the basement and like the lunchroom show with Susio with a uh, large professor and and Shakespeare and um you know like there was just it was just real cool. DJ J S one I think opened that show Sky Zoo and Torre perform also I remember um Chip Fu yes who is he's a beast how about you know this he is, is probably so nice on the mic right. man like talk about a dude who who deserves more shine like in fact yeah so Chip Fu went came back with homeboy Sandman on the on the that CMJ show, which was Stetsonic, People on the Stairs, Just Dice, Stetsonic, by the way. But we did this. Chuck D came to the show. I know. So yeah, we got a great photo with him. Um, Public Enemy, Chuck D, the legend, starts. He's just. I'm there taking pictures, and everyone's just like going crazy in the picture. I'm like, who's gone the stairs? Right. And I look up, and Chuck D's like videotaping with like a, with like one of those <laughs> like little handy cam cams. With a flip cam, it's Chuck D, and he jumps in, and everyone goes berserk. Right, he had a Knicks uh, shirt on. I remember that. Um, I know he introduced Seth oh, Sonic. Genius. And Shout out to Bow Legged Lou D. was there from Full Force, and uh, on that same night, Houdini, uh, Houdini, Ecstasy from Houdini. You know, the, the one of the most, the earliest successful yeah. act in rap, Houdini. So I yeah. coordinated this thing with um, with was, Ecstasy sorry, yeah. and his brother. Um, What's his brother's name? Because he had a similar name. See, this is why we should have writ- written things down. Well, Ecstasy and his brother, um, damn, Dynasty. And uh, they did this fastest rapper competition thing for like the Guinness Book of World Records. And it was a totally separate thing. And I, I finagled it into the middle of this bill. And it was Chip Fu and Homeboy Salmon were judging the fastest rapper competition. You know, and it was like... People just going up there going, bub, 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 like, you know, incomprehensible as far as lyrics go or anything like that. But it was to, you know, win this prize. And uh, it was, you know, X from fucking uh, Houdini. And it was incredible. That was all on that same night. Also, I want to say shout out to Freedom Williams of CC, uh, CNC Music Factory. Because yeah. he came out. I think there's, I have a photo pulled up. So there's a iconic, in my opinion, this is one of your one of your most iconic yeah. pictures. So it's J. Ru the Damager 
Scoob from the Alcoholics. Effects, the Alcoholics, and Freedom Williams from CNC Music Factory, who was actually more like, he's more of a head than people who know of CNC Music Factory now. Like, he's actually like a real hip hop oh, dude. Uh, take a step and go for yours on my command. Now hit the dance. <laughs> Gonna make you sweat till you bleed. Like, that was like a pop song. And, oh, for sure. You know, and it's when it you have a hip hop pop song back in the days. Yep. You know, that's big time stuff. Yeah, definitely. Um, who else? Who else we have in the mix? We have a little Tony Touch. I mean, we could just sit, we could sit here. I mean, in a way, I don't really care that we just uh, list the people that we're looking at. Do you recognize? Do you remember this guy? You recognize this guy? Yeah. So this is my friend, Mr. Dead. So he was yeah, such a cool guy. Shout out to oh, Mr. Yeah. Dead. But, well, I would like invite him to every single show because he was just fun to hang out with too. He rhymed. He's put out records, and he was a, a, a close collaborated with Prince Paul. A lot and his of cool dude, stuff. TOC, they would come to the club quite a bit. And uh, another regular. Um, and uh, as there were so many of them, for sure. Um, even uh, this cat, shout Dave Dar. Shout out to Beat Nuts. Oh, uh, yeah, shout out to Superstar Dave Dar. Yeah, he was there. I mean, okay, before we completely lose. Shout out Jay Ru. Yo, the shout damager. out to Jay Ru the Damager, though. He was a great Jay photographer. Ru. He's probably influenced a little bit Jay by Ru. you. No, no. Come on now. <laughs> Listen, Shout Jeru's Jeru. been taking pictures the whole time, man. Jeru's right. going to come out with a book one day, please. I hope so, yeah. Like, he, he's shooting film. I didn't know. I'm not. Nothing at all. Do you recognize this gentleman? So this was, he came, to, he started coming to the club quite a bit, too. We became friendly. This is Lord Jamar from, uh, uh, from Brand Nubian's brother. Um, his name was... Uh, was what was you it? know I was I always thought it was like that dude looks like Lord Jamar. It's his I brother. didn't realize it was his brother. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. He was. I want to say it's Justice. It might, I, it might be Justice. He he was also. What was he in a rap group as well? Nah, like an indie no. rap group. No. Nah. Was it? He was just hung he out. He's just. Uh, I don't know what he did. Was uh, he at the lunchroom show? Nah, nah. He kind of came for the classic the '90s stuff. Um, he would come through. I would be like, yo, Shout come through. Shout out to Craig just, G, by the way. Yeah, Craig Legendary G. Legendary Juice Crew. Greg Nice, who was off often at the club. No, Greg Nice at first didn't want me taking his picture at all. Like, I would be, he'd be really? like, no, no, please don't do it. He warmed up to you pretty quickly, though, it seemed like. He, no, I think there was one night he's like, that night, he's like, all right, I'll do a picture with Peter. <laughs> um... Who else? There's a couple of people I want to send shout outs to, to Lord Scotch, who was in a few of these, uh, not uh, at this particular show, but because we're looking at the, the, the Daz FX J with the Damage Big show. Jeff, shout out to Big Jeff. Yo, Big Jeff is a staple in New York City. Now, he is in many of your photos. He was always on the guest list. And uh, he's just Kynes everywhere. Guy. He is everywhere. I go to some little thing, and I don't go out like I, at all like I used to. I rarely go to shows. And Big Jeff, man, is still holding it down. And uh, what a, a New York, you know, luminary, nightlife character. Yeah, and he's he has um, produced a lot of shows as well. Absolutely, yeah. Life. More so, he's yeah, producer, host, curator. Do you recognize this gentleman right here? I sure do. OG Chino. Yeah, OG Chino. We worked together on a uh, on a large Professor album cover. Oh yeah. He used to manage uh, executioners. Was um, he created a lot of? He moved art. out to California. Yeah, he has a great uh, restaurant in Koreatown in L.A. Um, Get out of town. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. He's still working with music and stuff. Um, shit, uh, my man AC Kirby Dominant uh, Ryan Sikorsky. These are all guys that would be like backstage often because I would always. I still do yeah, this to this day. Yeah, Shout out Ryan, who's now. Uh, What's he up to? He, I think he's living in Florida. Oh, okay. Great dude. When I was in high school, I used to order records. I used to call him up on a landline. From okay. Fat Beats? Yeah, from Fat Beats when it was in the East Village, when it was the little tiny original Fat Beats. I'd be like, hey, what? I'd literally call Ryan Sikorsky up and be like, what white labels do you have in stock this week? You know, what bootlegs do you have? And he would, he would be like, let me check real quick. He'd like walk across the room. And be like, I got the Smith & Wesson, nothing moved but the money. I got the Rock Cam bootleg. And I'd be like, I'd just buy them and give them a credit card over the phone. You write it down and charge it. And shit. That's uh, 
<laughs> in like 1995. Um, so anyway, Lush Life. Lush Life. That was his brand. That's right. So what I'm hoping with this conversation that we're having is that it could possibly lead to us maybe being able to do a show, a showing, a gallery show, an opening, or a book of some kind, or all of the above, um, where we remember this period of time that you captured, Photo yeah, Rob, at the Knitting book. Factory. I think we should do a book, man. I think we should do a book on you know this, any publishers? this work. Um, I mean... Maybe we maybe we just start make some prints, do a show, and have a little party, and then and make put a book together or something. Could be like a like this conversation could be the spark that does a little show, like a little gallery show, and from that is the catalyst to possibly do a book, and then we do a larger show around the book release or when it's ready, and then uh, you know kind of try to. See where we can take it. I think that... That's just an idea, though. I think, you know, I will, if we do that, I think it would be... I really would love for it to have... Um, I would love for the stories from the musicians' perspectives to be the highlight, rather than... You know, oh, hey, look at this photographer talking about. Yeah, I. Agree. I, I want to hear like, I, I would love to hear like, like the stories from like, you know, like, like maybe like what if we let we would, would Prince Paul be interested in talking about like getting back together with Stetsasonic and doing that show and like, you know, or like what was it like for. Um, You know, digging in the crates to come together and have the guys really talk about their experiences because, right. like, really, uh, you know, from from a, a, being a hip hop fan and and having these pictures, like, what's I think it was more interesting is is the um, the stories from the musicians' perspectives. Like, there's some crazy stuff that happened. Like, yeah, like some of those nights and. Um, well, I think because our perspective is from. Two different yeah, vantage my, points. Yeah, you, know? like you are just you are in the zone. You are you are shooting the whole time, and people were walking past your lens. You are capturing them. I was running up and down the stairs, running back from front of house to the office to the to the to the box office to the you know people not being able to get in. It's like the artists and some of these characters that were regulars in the backstage. They were the ones that were actually like having fun. You know, like they were part of the party. They were the party. We sort of facilitated, I, I facilitated it, and you captured it so that we can actually, l like, literally look back at these moments in time. Like, like even this iconic photo from the stage of the DITC show when they were doing a Big L tribute. And one of my closest friends, Adam Harden, is down in there with his friend Sonny. Some DC guys that came up for that show, and they're just like... Uh, going crazy with the Big L tribute, and it's just capturing these moments in time is priceless. But getting it from there, that's what I'm saying. Is like when you when you like so when to hear Q Tip talk about his releasing the, that album Renaissance because he had, there was some quiet time before that, you know, where he hadn't put out music for a little bit while, right. and then you know his relationship with Cons and Busta Rhymes at that time. Yeah. And I know that Kanye West showed up to, you know, and at these times, you know, there was the, the forming of good music and stuff like that. So, I mean, to, I think would would be even more interesting um, to have, like maybe, I, I wouldn't mind staying out of the text of the book. And, and, Le and the, maybe the book should really be the story, uh, the stories of the musicians from their perspective. Yeah, because, um, I, I think you might be honest. You know, having like a you know the photographer talk about it. Yeah, that's fun, yeah. and I think fun for a podcast. But, exactly. But what's important to the music history, and you know, is is the real music history. Like, right. you know, because it's like sometimes like. You know, I remember there'd be nights where music, you know, like a musician, you know, musicians would meet and and like they would do a joint together. You know, right. a couple of weeks later, 
my god shout out to John Robinson by the way oh yeah absolutely How see that's what I mean here? like I'm fucking lot. up I'm fucking up guys and there's some independent promoters that I um, would like to shout out to but I can't remember everyone's name because this is we're talking about 10 years ago too uh, you know so there were some great guys that brought shows to the club that you shot a lot of times when you'd see like Emilio uh, what was his last Rojas. name Rojas yes or like uh, yo Emilio's work has changed like and you also see guys work develop over over time oh for sure like you know the, um, certain MCs have gotten so nice yeah definitely you know? You know, we'd see some early shows and be like, oh, yeah, they got potential and stuff. And then, like... You know someone we haven't talked to at all, and this might be a good one to maybe start to end the show on close with. And I know that, that you love this group. I adored them and uh, really, truly enjoyed working with them. And uh, they sort of were an anomaly because they were the kind of the only women performers in the whole mix of it all, but Nola Darling. Yeah, you know, it's like... I love. I know they them. moved to California. Yeah, they both moved. I don't life. think they're making music together now, but like really talented, um, just really talented, cool like singer MCs, uh, beautiful women, beautiful strong women. Yes, gorgeous, um, sophisticated, and uh, just like the stage show. It was a great mix of like yeah genres. Shout out, yeah, shout, shout out to Alex. And Jack, by the way, I think they're doing some acting now. Yes, I think in, so. In L.A., you know, which is, you know, not, not surprising to happen out in Los Angeles. Yeah, I've seen Alex in L.A. Uh, uh, in recent years. She came to a show, a People on a Stair show I did at the Troubadour. And she came through and hung out, and it was like a special treat to see her. Because, yeah, they they would really, they worked hard. I made a cameo shows. in an Nola Darling video. Word? Yeah, like I'm just a guy checking them out. <laughs> walking by down the street and like I like look lower my glasses and I think oh there's so God. many ca cameos in that video I think there's like it's like Fresh Dailies in the video Homeboy Sandman's in the video I think like um, guys from Kids in the Hall are in that video like there's a lot of cameos in there they had a cool movement going on like that collective of people you know yeah it was, it's, it's just really um yeah, it's it's a great time, great time in my life. I'm really grateful to be a part of it. I want to thank you. Thank I want to thank personally. you, thank you for your time. No, I'm grateful to be there, man. Like I See, think if you I weren't think there, that though, find was you know that in the Brooklyn Hip Hop Festival. Really oh yeah, because you were you, you were a big part of and and really opened up doors for me. You know because like yeah. you know now now you know praise the Lord I've been published in in you know every every um, hip hop magazine and every hip hop. Um, website right. and without having done uh, the work at the Knitting Factory and and the Broken Hip Hop Festival that would not have happened so shout out to Wes Jackson and, yeah. you and, and uh, Peter Oasis and uh, you know I, you know I'm not you know uh, I know the guys um, you, you think know, that's being picked up on the mic Oh, I'm crumbling a paper in my hand. Just, you know, my access is based on the kindness of, you know, I'm not, I'm not photographing a show if someone doesn't say, "Hey, Rob, you can come." Right. You know, and so my career is based on the kindness of others, and and the and having to be able to document brilliant performers. So. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I'm just grateful. I'm a hip hop head with a camera, and I take yeah. pretty good pictures. I work hard on my craft. I know I'm good at it, and I work hard to do it. You know, it's not like I'm just standing there pushing the button. Right, right. But within the same, within the same word, I, I do not take credit for. You know, I'm I'm photographing brilliant people. You know, so yes. I don't want you to confuse me with with. That. I'm documenting these guys, so yeah. I'm not. I'm not here to do a. Yeah, I mean, listen. I spent a lot. Grateful, of grateful to photograph this and be a part of this brilliant culture that's filled with just, just love and goodness. And um, I, you know, if any of the musicians that have helped me and allowed me to photograph you, um, I love you and I'm grateful to do it. And I thank you. 
Oh, right, man. Uh, well, you know, if you hadn't been there to document that, and all those shows, and, you know, we were both at very particular places in our lives at that time, too, um, then it's almost as though it wouldn't have existed, you know? So it's... Uh, uh, and I come from a documentary kind of filmmaking background and I got I went to college for journalism and and you know I started as a magazine writer in the mid 90s and all through the two th early 2000s and stuff so to be able to capture that stuff is is very important because it speaks to a particular period of time in in all of those people's lives I know any of those people that were photographed will look back and it reminds them of where they were at in that in that particular time whether they had uh maybe it was before they had kids it was before a big album came out it was like maybe their grandparents now or some or some of our friends that have that have been lost that were that were made big impacts on our lives even back then so it's there's just so a great many, document yeah and there's so many stories that we're missing like you and i just talking and remembering certain things and 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 oh we're and just listening that, too you know like very important things in, in changing of lives and stuff like that um you know did did Sandman meet peanut butter wolf at the knitting factory and you know did um you know did the did the reunion of uh you know uh did did the dit see reunion cause some new music to be created or or for you know um, a, a particular producer Diamond E starting to work with this guy like right. you know there's stories there's, there's probably like so many stories that, that we don't even know about that I think it would be really cool to you know maybe try to pull together a lot of the best imagery and then start talking to the um so I talked to, to the musicians about like, hey, you know, would you be interested in contributing to this? And right, and you know, because the story, I don't think the story is was what we're talking about. No, our experiences were different. I mean, listen, like when I got sucker punched in the face by the bouncer at the club at the Knitting Factory uh, uh, during the Rock Hem show, it was because I was just trying to get take a break to go outside um, in the middle of the show. It's like okay consequence just finished and black thought is about to get on so i got a little bit of time to kind of take some time who knows what other type of shit was going on in the club during that like 30 minutes where i like you know slowly edged my way back through a totally oversold out crowd got to the front door noticed uh some security like basically putting a dude in a yoke on the ground and then i was with uh, a buddy of mine i motioned towards them and, and uh and acknowledge what was going on before I could turn my head back around. Whap! I got like you know punched in the side of my my. But it eye. wasn't an accident. Like it was an intentional sucker punch that was aimed directly at me because he he didn't like that I was you know observing them and he he took it a certain way and I wasn't firing shots at nobody. But that was a catalyst for a whole bunch of other shit because there was a lot of other guys who were friends of mine that are you know maybe a little more aggressive than i was so that whole shit you know people wanted to get at him and i had to tell them please don't do anything like that you know like i'll i'll take an l on that you know i didn't get knocked out and i didn't get knocked down but um i did get a you know i did get hit hard with a fist by a guy that's like twice my size and i was like you know uh and it was what it was, but that was just one experience in a night full of all types of crazy shit that went down. Yeah, that you night know? was just like well, the best night of my life. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, <laughs> no, I mean, no, I feel you. It was for a lot of people. Experience. Like Yo. that night, right? So, monster, like so, having been backstage and getting to know everyone that worked there, and shout out to the staff and. And the guy's like, so, so Rakem was like, yo, clear the green room, get everyone out of here. Why did we call it the green room? Was it, was it even green? Yeah, it was more like the trash room. That was, like, that room had, it was, it was black and, and red. Different oh, yes, purple. black and red, the upstairs, upstairs. backstage. Yeah, yeah. Not green at all, Peter. But so no. Rakem was like, yo, clear everyone out of here. I don't want anyone hanging out. 
but since I had known everybody, I was kind of allowed to linger a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And since I had shot like every night, they're like, oh, you, Rob, you're supposed to be here. So they cleared the whole backstage, but I was still there and had my light there. So when they were going on stage, there were a couple people on stage, like, um, hanging around, because uh, I think Questlove was still up there. He had just performed. Right. Um, I think you had Sasha Jenkins. Yeah, he was, was hosting. He was hosting. Yeah. Um, uh, Dante Ross, I think, was up there. Um and who had DJ Dante yeah, DJ? But by, by the way, shout out to the DJs that night. You had a lineup of great DJs. Some yeah. showed, some didn't, but yeah, I, I think it was just like a, a win for DJs that night. Yeah, Real DJ stupid. Amir, Geology, um, Gel, and uh, No Storm. Yeah, Psycho Less DJ. Yeah, anyway, Psycho Less DJ is real cool. Yeah, all forty fives. So yeah, yeah. So. And so I'm on stage, like, and they're like, "Okay, Rob, you can go on stage," and they'd cut it off. And by the way, I think somebody from um, did Brand Nubian had just performed that night too, yeah. because like there was a friend of of Brand Nubian who was hammered and trying to get on stage, or wouldn't get out of the background area, and Rock Kemp's people were trying to get on, so somebody just grabbed the dude and threw him down the stairs, and then Sadat came in banging on the door that you're not supposed to open, and then to like help his friend out so he wouldn't get hurt and then Rakim went on stage and they're like okay no one's going on stage I'm, and they're like the guy would cut it off and I was right there and he's like alright Rob you can go on stage wow. so I got to be on stage for my favorite MC of all time who is the greatest MC of all time sorry you guys <laughs> that's just the truth of the matter <laughs> no I think it's uh, you know we talk about top fives and all of that like right. It's, it's 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 about your life and who's your top five. Totally. So he's my number one. Anyway, so I'm on stage and there's a moment where Rakim is talking to me. He's like, yo, picture man, get the shot. So. And I'm taking pictures right out. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, oh my God, Rakim's talking to me. How cool to have this, this, this legend who's really influenced my life by his poetry and his message. You know, he was kind of like a big brother figure right. through his music. So... And he was just talking to me, so I see these great shots close up rock cam, like right in my lens. And, um, um, you know, it was funny because that back door you weren't supposed to open. And, and on your birthday night, like I'm backstage, it was, I think everyone was, was out of the room and I was just chilling, like, you know, in the backstage area. And so nice and smooth and performing. I ran up, took some pictures from, from the top, and, you know, um, and I'm backstage, and all of a sudden, right in the middle of the show, it's like, someone's banging on the door. <laughs> and you had said, don't ever open this door. <laughs> like, you're not allowed to open the door, Rob. Don't any, open the door. Because one person would open, like 10 people could run backstage. Yo, I know. So, I'm not opening the door, and someone's banging fucking hard. Like, like you, like you, I thought it was you. So if I, I wouldn't have like, to bang. That was my house. I could go into any door in that place. Exactly. <laughs> you were I running key down that. the stairs. Yeah. So, anyways, finally, I'm like, "Fuck it, I'm opening this door because whoever it is is banging fucking hard." Mm. And I open the door, and it's Greg Nice on the mic, like he's literally <laughs> he's rhyming, and and he's like, you know, he, he's dancing and rhyming, and he's and he's like rhyming and looking at me like I gotta get back on stage, kind of. <laughs> So I'm like, holy shit! Like it was hilarious. I, I don't hilarious. have any pictures of that, but because I think I was just in shock and just like, what the fuck is going? So on? he had a wireless mic and walked from the stage to through the box. He had jumped back up around. He had jumped in the crowd. Yeah, I don't know. I was backstage and was like trying to get back on stage through that door. Yeah, in the, in the middle of the song, so he was rhyming and trying to get out the stairs. So dope. I love Greg. Nice is my brother, man. Yeah, what a great night. And just seeing them rocking on stage with a giant bottle of Hennessy. And Dwick the, is one of the best rap yeah. songs of all time. So yeah, maybe. definitely. Well, we could do, we could talk uh, about we, this we. stuff forever. forever. And uh, I'm so grateful that we have the work that we have together, man. It's cool. It's so fun. Every time we've talked over the years, albeit sporadically since the Knitting Factory closed, it's always like super fun and fulfilling to kind of catch up and reminisce a little bit so i'm hoping that this 
this conversation can lead to some sort of thing where we properly memorialize it. And I know we've talked about it a few times in this conversation. So, but thank you for your time, for getting down with the house list and coming to Brooklyn. And I think it's cool, man. And I'm just a big fan of your work and you as a human being. I think we work well together. I think that's the reason why we have so many of these nights because you shot, uh, you know, probably 20 nights in the club and hundreds and hundreds of people, subjects that you shot. Um, is because if you were, you know, if you were an asshole, if you were like, you know, not who you are as a human being, like, um, then after that first night, you would have never been back up in that motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? Because that was my call. And I wanted you there because you were cool and we vibed together. And I fuck with you because uh, you're a cool dude. And uh, yeah, thanks, man. yeah, for sure. So thank you. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for your time. Oh, man. Thank you, Peter. I really thank you. Yeah, for sure, man. Yo, thank you guys for listening. Shout out to Photo Rob for his time and being a part of history at the Knitting Factory. Those shows I did, Q-Tip, uh, DITC, Rockem, so many, many, many other artists, too. I mean, we just sit there for hours talking about all the artists that um, came through, that were photographed. It was really a very special moment in time. I'm so happy to have been there for it and to have played a part in that history of new york city nightlife thank you guys if you ever went to any of those shows too shouts to y'all hey please take a couple of minutes or even a couple of seconds to subscribe to this podcast i need you guys to help me spread the word on this thing if you're on itunes or apple podcast rather please rate and review it just take a second to just hit that five star like button it goes a long way and uh, let me know should i do a patreon i need to figure out a way to generate a little bit of operational uh cost to keep this thing going if you guys want me to keep this doing once a week um i might need to figure out a way to generate a little bit more revenue than whatever i can scrape out of the bottom of my piggy bank you know what i'm saying so uh with that being said Thanks. Again, every episode is edited and engineered by CJ Stewart. My name is Peter Agassi. I'm the host and producer. You have been listening to the House List Podcast. Tell somebody, all right? Thanks, y'all. And I will catch you on the next one. Peace.